very much, Professor Simon, for your brilliant paper. I think we can open for discussion because your subject is, so is different, yes. isn't it? Okay, so it's very different. If you have any questions, just give me enough time. Yeah. <laughs> Commentaries. People look very sober. You should be laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I have been sure. Yes. I'm just saying how amazing it is to me that, that Moore could be quite so funny in the tower because one of his most brilliantly funny works, as you know, is the yeah. dialogue of comfort. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Includes all those jokes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the interesting things about Moore in that sense that, that, that very clearly here he is in the tower. He knows what's going to happen. He's having dreams, nightmares about being tortured and hung and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and yet there, there is this tremendous sense of consolation. And what I'm suggesting here in this paper is that what we see in the religious polemics, as we saw it in perhaps other works by, by Moore, going back to the epigrams, going back to Utopia, everybody talks about that, so I didn't want to get into it. But uh, the idea of, uh, of, of, of humor as a, as a defense mechanism. Uh, the one who laughs is superior, and he's resolved that knows that he's superior, and so that he can, he can, he can engage in it. Even when he's talking to his daughter, Anne, uh, Margaret, mm -hmm. and he has that wonderful line about her being uh, Mistress Eve, coming to tempt him. Uh, mm -hmm. She's... It, it's the most, one of the saddest and, and the most pathet not path pathos, Hmm. Uh, engendering scenes. Here is the daughter trying to save her father's life. Your father, you're an idiot. You're not signing this dumb thing. You know, do it. Just live. We can refurbish the house. And uh, and he says no. Uh, you're acting like Eve. And you say, well, that's cute, right? But what did Eve do? That's a credible and a, a, a very very bitter uh, type of analogy. Isn't it recorded by her husband? Well, he does that, yes. And those, a lot of that, a lot of those stories that do come through the the, the tower works are perhaps have been edited uh, or invented. Uh, but uh, my feeling is, generally, looking at more as I have been, uh, and perhaps defending myself here, uh, <laughs> that. Uh, uh, it's very likely that Moore would, would have said something like that. Different. Just like the, 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 the business about the beard and his scaffold. and uh, The one line that's added that I thought was, was real Moore was the fact that when he tells the headsman, uh, don't feel bad about this. Uh, you're going to give me a gift today that is the greatest that I've ever had. Well, my God, from the, from the, from the, uh, from the, uh, the, the last four things, a very early work that he didn't quite get finished, uh, he's talking about dying as something mm -hmm. that is going to bring him to heaven. Mm -hmm. You'll talk about that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's consistent. Yes. Yeah, sure, Jen. Um, yeah, thank you very much for reading the paper. I've got two points. Um, one that perhaps continues on, on the discussion of before. Would you agree that... Um, more sense of humor is perhaps another point that a point of continuity between his humanist polemics and um, and and his Reformation polemics, especially um, since I think um, he uses the same arguments basically when deriding uh, scholastic um, sophisms and and when deriding uh, Luther's or Tyndall's uh, practice of of resting uh, interpretation. Of, of resting the sense of, of scripture or of, of, uh, of kind of uh, misinterpreting in, in an absurd way uh, the doctrine and, and, and the scriptures. Um, that, that would be my first point. And, and that also leads me to a second point where I would perhaps question a point that you made. Um, I would argue that um, Moore's criticism of, of Tyndall's translation of the Bible is not so much What's an, what's an issue there is, is perhaps not so much English as a language that uh, Moore thought the, the Vulgate as, as a sacred, uh, Moore thought the, the Vulgate to be a sacred text and that it was kind of a, um, a profanation to, uh, to turn it into English because 
on the one hand, there is a passage, in, I think, in the Dialogue of Heresies, where he, where he explicitly argues for an English translation, mm -hmm. um, for the Bible to be translated properly and mm -hmm. then distributed to the people under, under church authority mm -hmm. so that uh, the correct interpretation would be ensured and so forth. And on the other hand, we have his early uh, defenses of, of Erasmus, where mm -hmm. he defends precisely a deviation mm -hmm. from the Vulgate. Uh, concerning this passage on uh, in the beginning was the word where Erasmus mm -hmm. would say more instead of verbum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, the the common point that comes up in both um, well the defense of Erasmus and the argument against Tyndall mm -hmm. is um, is wresting language from its common usage. He defends Erasmus's term sermo as being uh, the most commonly used word. Um, that comes closest to the meaning of uh, of the passage in Greek, and he uh, argues against Tyndall because, it, especially these words, individual words that he criticizes, uh, congregations and church and, and so forth, um, he argues against Tyndall also from this humanist point of view that he was resting, like a scholastic, he was resting uh, the biblical sense from its common from its common meaning, and he, he very much stresses the, the common usage of, of English um, uh, in favor of his of, of the terms that he defends. So, so I would see this linguistic argument behind both his defense of Erasmus mm -hmm. and behind the criticism of Tyndall, rather than English um, or the vernacular mm -hmm. as a problem. Well. Good, good, very good points. Uh, first of all, I would say Thomas More was Thomas More, and he was a humanist by sensibility, training, love, affection. He loved to read, he loved to meditate, he loved to do the text. And, and, and as a humanist, he was reading the classical literature, and he was mastering Greek so that he could read classical literature. So the consistency of his, of his class, his, his, uh, his humanism is there. I cite, happen to, I cite simply the authors that, that fit the, the, the notion of, of humor, Lucian, big time, uh, and then Aristophanes and the others that were available to him at the time. So very much so, the humanist sensibility is there, the anti-scholasticism of the humanists, and that's a complicated issue, that's open to cliché, because uh, uh, the, the, the humanists were scholastical, the scholastics weren't so bad, uh, and uh, uh, but the the general tenor of that was the idea of rhetoric over logic, or the sense of logic taken to its rigor uh, creates obfuscation and silliness, whereas rhetoric can take you silliness, but you enjoy it more. Uh, the, uh, the 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 that type of thing. So, that, but but in the example that I raise, yes, when he talks to Dorf about the critics of Erasmus. And he is attacking the theologians uh, uh, at uh, Louvain and uh, in, in Paris, for that matter. Uh, he is calling them all sorts of names, same names, same criticism of their religious attitudes and anti-humanist attitudes that he identifies with the with the uh, with the heretics. Now, the third point uh, is uh, on the translation. Moore is the a lawyer. He knows the law. Bottom line, it's against the law to translate the Bible into English unless it's authorized by the church. Oxford Convention, 1408, more or less. I hate to ad lib dates, but I think it's 1408. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a long standing. They followed the Lollards, right? And so Moore sees Luther as, as, as Wycliffe, or he sees Tyndall as Wycliffe, and he sees the Lollards as the. As the as the uh, German peasant revolt and so on, and uh, social disorder and all sorts of awful things going on. So he's, 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 he's there to, to simply enforce the law. On the other hand, of course, he has his own vision of, of, the, of the Lutheran uh, uh, doctrine because he sees it as much more than, than just biblical translation. He admires Erasmus, but what's Erasmus doing? Erasmus is going from Greek to Latin, from Latin back to Greek. Both of those languages are perfectly legitimate for Moore. Why? Because they were legitimate for St. Jerome. Jerome, of course, included Hebrew and perhaps or Aramaic and perhaps Hebrew. Uh, Tyndall knows the Hebrew. Moore doesn't. But for Moore, the sacred languages are simply Greek and Latin. 
And that's the language that you should have. And you don't recite the Torah in any other language but Hebrew. You can translate it, but not legitimately. And I use that analogy simply because religions all have their sacred language. And their language is sacred because their te the text is considered sacred. So what makes the text sacred? The words, the language. What makes the language sacred? The text. Mm -hmm. Religion is peculiar that way. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that there is, I, I was Take impressed a by, by Wazwo, W-A-S-W-O. -W -O. Richard, is it? Yes. Oh, she's a showing how the late scholastics were actually closer to post Syrian modern linguistics than, than we often remember, and that Moore's attitude toward language was perhaps more sophisticated than Tyndall's. And this got, in fact, some of the reformers into trouble because the literal meaning is um, <coughs> such a dubious theological concept. Yeah, there was another paper in the Moore group here uh, that uh, that talked with the, the notion of the, oh no, it was it was last night that plenum meeting with uh, Professor Muller talking about the the uh, the nature of uh, of vernacular languages and why vernacular oh, yes. languages in were an impediment to biblical. Well, we didn't use biblical translation, but uh, why why Greek and Latin were idealized and why vernacular languages were retarded uh, in places except for Italy and France. And, uh, and why in Germany, for example, everything was scholastically, or uh, uh, academically was done in, in, in Latin mm -hmm. for a long time. Okay. And uh, all the Renaissance passed in Latin rather than German, whereas in England it got late, you know, later. And uh, Moore's English uh, and spelling and so forth got improved by the writers that followed him. Uh, but uh, Italy was the first to invent a, 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 a vernacular language that they all loved. Well, thank you very much. I think